All right. Well, welcome back. We, we, uh, we're going to pick up this morning with, uh, this evening, with um, John Witherspoon walking off the gangplank into the port of Philadelphia. He has been called to be president of uh, the uh, College of New Jersey, uh, which is the uh, early name for Princeton University. Now, uh, and we get into that, you're going to, uh, you might get a little confused. I always have to separate and tease it apart. This is not Princeton Seminary. Uh, that will come later. But the reason it will come later, of course, is because Princeton University will branch out and come in, go into various other fields, and they will feel the need to um, start a specific seminary later. But right now, that school is, is, is going to be built for the raising up and training of ministers particularly, although not exclusively. So he's uh, coming over, he's going to assume the presidency of this school, and that reflects on things we've learned about him so far, that he was classically educated, that he exercised uh, a great deal of his um, uh, acumen and perfected his ability in rhetoric and debate in uh, college himself, as well as getting a, a solid Calvinistic grounding in, uh, in theology. And we notice that he, uh, he took that and applied it in two ways in his, in his pastorates in Scotland. One was that he was devoted as a minister to his people, uh, taught them from the catechism and, uh, and, and taught them the doctrines of, of Calvinism uh, quite thoroughly. But he also involved himself in social issues because uh, in those days particularly, uh, the ministers were looked up to because of their education and, uh, and, uh, and he uh, was involved with the uh, class disputes, uh, the political intrigues that went into uh, the, um, uh, the parish uh, church uh, pastorate assignments. Uh, as well as the political aspects of all of that. So he has, he has been able to uh, sharpen and fine-tune his ability to deal with people at all levels. He is respectful and he is kind, uh, and he, but he is firm in holding his convictions, and he recognizes those that feel differently than he does very readily. It's very distinct. And you remember that uh, in his opposition of the moderates, that uh, that came to a climax with his ecclesiastical characteristics, which was the kind of last straw that he put in trying to uh, wake them up by satirizing the moderates' position that everything is just fine and we need to maintain the status quo and don't rock the boat. And he went after them with, uh, with, that, with, on, with that book that, uh, that just... Um, infuriated them in, because it was so precise, it was so well written, and it was so accurate. So Witherspoon is, is, uh, is quite the sharpened weapon for the Lord at this point, and he accepts the call uh, the second time, uh, and we're going to get into what that, what that was all about in just a minute. But before we do that, let's get a running start on education in the colonies. Now this is where we this is where we, we reach back to last year's Reformation celebration and the Puritan in, impact on, in, on the colonies in the early days. Um, the, remember the pillars of Puritan education, uh, we stressed uh, to, very importantly that they valued truth and knowledge and were averse to ignorance. This, is no, this does not fit some stereotype that says, well, they're religious and therefore they just want to keep your head in a bucket and they don't want you to understand anything, and, uh, and it, but this, that's exactly wrong. The uh, Puritans were definitely uh, interested in educating you uh, to the best of your ability. Clear thinking about the purpose and the end of education was the focus. Their goal was indeed to produce a godly man. Uh, righteousness and morality is part of true godly education, but that is not the focus uh, completely. Uh, it's the education was thorough, scientific, uh, according to the day, and, uh, and the curriculum was thoroughly classical and classically humanistic, uh, not humanistic in the sense of man-centered as it is today, but humanistic in the sense that it embraces all kinds 
of, uh, of, um, uh, core of subjects and issues and m m attempts to nest them together. Uh, to, and it, the, the third is to educate the whole person for all of life through a comprehensive rather than a specialized education. And for those of you who might be involved in classical education, you know that that still stands today. The idea, the theory is that even through the college level, we educate thoroughly on a general level uh, and not to specify too quickly so that when you are going on to a master's level, you are able to, ha to grasp the specifics of that, of that target goal, that target subject, and do it well. Uh, and so you start by the, the classical education base and the well-rounded liberal arts education, as, as it's uh, often referred to today. But then after that, you go into the specialties. Uh, none too soon, uh, you get this grounding first. Um, also to remind you, the first colleges that were started in the colonies, it's important to get this chronologically straight. The new college, uh, which, which eventually would become Harvard, uh, was started by the Puritans in 1636. It originally was meant to train pastors for uh, ministry. The second uh, college was down in Virginia, and that was done uh, by the Episcopalians, or the Church of England, in 1693. And then there was the Collegiate School, or Yale, as it later became known, and that was started in Connecticut by the Puritans again in 1701. So the Puritans are way out in front in trying to establish a, um, a foothold in the colonies with regard to that education. Now when it comes to the introduction of Presbyterianism, I wanted to interject this here, right in the midst of the unfolding and the starting of those, of those colleges, Francis McCamey arrives in Philadelphia in 1683. He's the, um, he's the, he's the Irish Presbyterian minister who has been ordained and sent on the mission field of getting churches started, Presbyterian churches started in the, United, in the colonies. And he lands in Maryland, and he immediately raises up seven or eight different churches in Maryland and Virginia, and organizes them into a, uh, um, well, I, I'll just go out here, I'll stick to the text here. 1660, Presbyterianism has been stifled in England, you remember that you know, William and Mary came along and they didn't have anything to do, uh, Charles II rather, didn't have anything to do with the Westminster Confession, so he set it aside. But in Scotland they embraced it and, they, and the Parliament approved it and it became part of the, it became the doctrine of the Church of Scotland. And uh, so in 1658, uh, Francis McCamey uh, was born in, in Ulster. He attended the University of Glasgow where he was converted in 1681. He was ordained. And in 1683, he arrives in Maryland on his mission. In 1705, he's able to raise up already seven or eight churches and get the, uh, an original presbytery started. So he's a fast worker. Uh, there's, there's already Christians in the area. They want to become organized, but he is, he is really able to uh, do a fury, a whirlwind of work to get these churches organized and established. Uh, in 1726... This is still early in the 1700s. In 1726, William Tennant is called to, I'm sorry, it, yeah, William Tennant as opposed to Francis McCamey. This is William Tennant down here. William Tennant is called to the northern Philadelphia area to pastor one specific church. And, uh, and he is, he is, he's a Scottish uh, Presbyterian. He's born in uh, Linlith, Galshire. I love that name. I have seen the castle at Linlithgow, and it is wonderful, but Linlithgow Shire is kind of, anyway. Um, educated at Edinburgh, you remember that's a solid Calvinistic school, and so he comes out of that. In 1706, he's ordained by the Church of Ireland. He, he emigrates to Pennsylvania in 1718. Now, just keep that in the back of your mind. Here are the, here's the map of the colonies that we have, we looked at last year. There's the northern colony, colonies, there's the central colonies, and then there's the southern colonies. Each one of these groups of colonies, we, we just naturally think of them as 13 colonies, and they're all the same, and everybody thinks the same. 
but they weren't. They all had their own agendas, they all had their own priorities, they all had their own backgrounds, and they all had their own motivations. And to just remind you, the, uh, the whole concept of slavery was introduced in the southern colonies because they're growing tobacco, and that's a profit-making business. But that's not the case in the mid or in the northern parts. Harvard is up here in Massachusetts. William and Mary is, where's my dot? Down there. William and Mary is down here in Virginia. Here's Yale right here. And then Tennant, William Tennant is here in Pennsylvania, next door to New Jersey. And there is a desire now. Tennant is ministering and he's, he's on fire and he's, he's raising up um, other students of the, of, uh, of the ministry. And there's a desire is, is particularly strong among Presbyterians. The early days of the colonies were very strong for Presbyterianism. The Baptists and the Methodists would all come after the war. The Presbyterians were one of the earliest ones into the colonies, and they are the ones that are growing and, and doing very well. And so now there's a desire particularly strong among the Presbyterians not only to educate their sons, but also to procure suitable candidates for the ministry. So here's the, here's the tenants in Pennsylvania, and he wants a school that he can send his, his kids to. He wants a school that he can send his minister candidates to. Um, but preparing a man for the ministry was difficult if you were in Philadelphia because it meant that you either had to go north all the way to Harvard, which was very expensive, or north to Connecticut, which was no less expensive, or all the way down to Virginia, which was also expensive and time-consuming, or because the Presbyterians that were sending these missionaries over to the colonies still had their hands in the, in the till, so to speak. You have to do it as we want you to do it. They would send their students to Europe again, uh, to England or to Scotland to be trained, and as a result of that, it, would be, it was outrageous. There was no alternatives for them. Uh, so in 1727, Tennant strikes out on his own. And he, uh, he builds a, a log college. Uh, he builds a, a log cabin. It's a, it's a large log cabin. Now, his first intent was just to train his own four sons. He had four sons. And he wanted to train them all for the ministry. And so that was his real intent, was just, I'm going to build a, build a classroom, and we're going to have school in this, in, this, uh, in this cabin. But before long, there were nine other students who wanted to sign up and, and take tenants courses. He was the only one teaching. He was the only one who had any education, uh, any professorial experience in this. And so he erected this cabin. And, uh, and it, was, it could hardly compare, of course. Harvard and Yale were well down the line in terms of prestige and money. And so the log, co the log school was looked down upon and made fun of and was regard nicknamed the Log College. You know, country bumpkins back in the woods are pretending to teach one another kind of thing. And because of that, the qualifications for the school were held in question almost right away. I'm not sure this is actually up to our standards. They were not eager to, to move forward on that. But the real thing that Tennant introduced would be something that would go on to change the landscape of the, of the United States. And that was that he introduced a third priority or a third angle to the Christian faith. The first angle, of course, the first, prior, the first kind of sense of Christianity came out of um, Roman Catholicism to Anglicanism. Being a member of the state church was all it took. And, you know, you, you stay within the, in the, line, in the guidelines, you stay in the, between the curbs, and everything is just fine. It doesn't, you know, that's, that's, what, defini that's what defined Christianity. The second was the Calvinists who were in the position of kind of turning the tables over. Martin Luther came over and, you know, disrupted Roman Catholicism. 
John Calvin came along and, you know, uh, and, uh, and he said, doctrine is, is, is everything. Cal you know, the Calvinism is the, the institutes, the, 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 the books that he wrote. The doctrine is the most important thing. Um, Tennant introduced a third angle, and that was the focus on experiential religion. Have you been saved, brother? This is the first time this became a real priority. I don't care if you're of the Church of England. Being a member of uh, a, a Reformed church is not enough. I want to know if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that's not an illegitimate angle to stress, but it is the first time that this is being introduced, and that created a stir in the colonies. This was uncomfortable for a few reasons. But one of the things that was going on is he, his emphasis was not solely on the Westminster Confession of Faith, and he also did not like the moderates. So he was making enemies on both sides. You know, the, he, was, he was softening his approach to doctrine, but he also saw the moderates as sleepyheads and where's the food and, you know, easy life, and he didn't want any part of them either. So he is cutting a new path that's very different. One of his, his oldest son was named, give me an example of this, his oldest son was named Gilbert Tennant. He was born uh, back in... Um, Scotland, he was, or Ireland rather, he was homeschooled by his father, William, in those early days, and he immigrated with the family. He and the whole family came to Philadelphia when his dad took the call to uh, Philadelphia. He, uh, he went to get his master's in, at Yale in 1725, and he has actually assisted his father in building the log college after that. And in 1726, he was called to a church in New Brunswick, New Jersey, he joined Whitfield. Now is the time when Whitfield is coming on, and he's going around the colonies preaching this new experiential religion doctrine. And he's preaching in the fields. He's not under church authority. That's a problem. You know, you're not, you're not under the elders here, the Reformed would say. And you're pressing things that are making my people uncomfortable, the moderates would say. And Whitfield is going around saying, have you been saved? Are you, are, do you have a relationship with Christ? And Gilbert Tennant is joining in with him in all of that. Um, New Brunswick uh, Presbytery, uh, the Presbyterians continue to grow, and New Brunswick Presbytery is formed out of, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in New York area out of both Yale and Log College students. Now that's, that's funny. You've got the hard-nosed uh, people over here. You've got the Yale represents um, the, the moderates as well as some of the Calvinists, not many, but some. And then you, over here, you've got the Log College uh, crowd, and they are experiential. So the sparks are going to fly. Every, anybody ever heard of David Brainerd? David Brainerd is an interesting guy. David Brainerd, uh, in 1739, recorded in his diary that he was converted through a spiritual experience of unspeakable glory. So which side is he going to be on? Experiential. Yes, he's the focus is on, are you saved, brother? Experiential. And he entered Yale to prepare for the ministry. He thought that was the best place to go, so he went there. Brainerd was not, as an experiential focus, Guy, he was not impressed at all with Yale professors and their dry, dusty doctrinal instruction and all of their we stay between the lines kind of thing. And he even in his youth blurted out a few things he probably shouldn't have. He criticized the rector, that's the, that's the principal of the school, saying that he had no more grace than a chair. <laughs> and that he should have fallen down dead for fining students for their evangelical zeal. Apparently that was one of the ways they maintained discipline at Yale was to fine students for outbursts and for protests and for uh, those kinds of things. 
For those uh, indiscretions, shall we say, Brainerd was kicked out of Yale. That did not sit well with a whole lot of people. They thought that he had been picked on and, and attacked unnecessarily. And the same year, Gilbert Tennant, in his church in, up in New Brunswick, preached a sermon that was entitled, The Danger of the Unconverted Ministry. This was along the same line as Whit, I mean, um, uh, Witherspoon's ecclesiastical characteristics back in Scotland. He was attacking those that he thought he didn't have a relationship, a saved relationship with Jesus Christ. And this, it, this created a furor. Now, you see what's going on here. These guys are not just sleepy heads, you know, going through the motions or uh, holding to doctrine. They are on fire. And they are contesting the truth. And they are pushing uh, in every way they can. They are alive and they are fighting for what is true. And so we've seen, you know, several characters now on various sides of this that are... Um, that are alive with their devotion, devoted commitments to, uh, to the gospel. So, a year later, the Great Awakening explodes. It is experiential in nature. However, it starts in Jonathan Edwards' church. Under his preaching, not out in the fields, not extra ecclesiastical or outside the church, it's in his church. And he doesn't know what to do with it at the first, he does, but he studies it compassionately, writes about it, and accepts it as real. He says the, the Great Awakening, the, the emotional reaction to the gospel, the conviction of sin, the, the joy and salvation, that's emotionally demonstrated, he says, is real. I'm not dismissing this. This is real stuff. And, uh, and he takes a long time to study that. And so things are beginning to explode. Now, that brings a great deal of tension in the Presbyterians, who at this point are going, doing great. Now there is tension in the ranks of the Presbyterians. Well, you expected that, right? On the one side, you've got the Scotch the Scots and the Scotch-Irish, and on the other side you've got the New Englanders. We'll just use those terms to divide the two. The Scots are careful on doctrine. Westminster Confession of Faith. Yes. They, are, uh, they, they say you must go to a legitimate school. Log College is not acceptable. You must go to a legitimate school. Harvard and Yale are still acceptable in our eyes, although Harvard's getting a little swarmy. They're beginning to liberalize uh, even by that time. But they realize it's far too expensive. That's, what the com that's the complaints of the New Englanders. The Scots say you must have a proper formal education. You can't send a minister out in the field when he hasn't even studied under a professor. Uh, you ha he has to have a straightforward education. He's got to have the Bible down. He's got to know one end from the other. The New Englanders say no. The primary emphasis in a minister is he should be saved. He should know the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is in him, he will be led by that Spirit to properly teach the Word. He doesn't have to sit in your classroom for three years in order to prove himself. He can go to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will open up his eyes to him. Uh, he, the, uh, in, the, the Scots argue for full subscription to the Westminster Confession of Faith. We talked about that last week. That was a way of guarding the Presbyterians from the moderates, those who were a little bit slippery, uh, going liberal. They were, the best way to do this is to make sure everybody's lockstep with the Westminster Confession. The New Englanders are saying, no, the Bible should be the, the uh, real reason for our unity. We should not have to go to a man-made doctrine. We should not have to uh, attach to that. The Bible should be the common standard of faith and practice. We have no need to bind men's conscience to a man-made document. That was their main protest. The Scots say we must have churches and church government and church organized and led worship. The church must be in control. The parish church, the presbytery, the synod, the general assembly, that is the definition 
of our, uh, of our practice, and that is what it must stay within those guidelines. The New Englanders were saying, no, what's wrong with revivals? What's wrong with uh, out, outside, uh, you know, out in the field preaching? What's wrong with preaching in train stations? What's wrong with calling uh, you know, factory workers to, to, to Christ? They wanted to preach outside the pa- bounds, bypassing even the ordination requirements. Who says I have to have your stamp of approval to preach the gospel? So they're, they're very angry. They're very radical, and they're, and they're really uh, you know, driven by their own passion for the Lord. And, and so these, these are all within the Presbyterians. And this begins as these two sides begin to pull apart. They get nicknames. The Scots begin to be called the old side. Old. Goofs, you know. And the others are the new, preppy, we're with it side. And so the old side and the new side begin to uh, pull apart in the Presbyterian church. Eventually, the, the, uh, the obvious conclusion happens in 1741, just, just one year after this uh, begins to explode. There is a split in the Presbyterian church, one of the very first ones. And it happens between the old side and the new side. And if you take a look at the back of your sheet, this is what Joyce has been waiting for me to talk about. You take a look at the back of your sheet. This is a chronological, let me get the right button here. This is a chronological flow of the relationships that you have within the Presbyterian church. This is just the Presbyterian family tree, okay? And the, all of the various things that happen in the Presbyterian church from 1700 to 1980 in this particular one, um, are listed here. Now what we're talking about is this right here, this box. The old side, new side split of 1741. Now before that, what the first Presbytery in 1706, first synod in 1777, 1717, the adopting act, you remember that that was an effort to reconcile the two sides. Didn't quite work. And now there's a, a split in 1741 in the Presbyterians. You got the new sides, the hip guys, and the old guys who, uh, who don't want to hear about it. And uh, now, as, we, as you look at this, I always have to say this, because um, I am a Presbyterian, and I love the Presbyterians, and I'm devoted to Presbyterian history. Yes, this is embarrassing. This is dreadful. You see so many splits. This is ugly. This is not the way the church should function. But what I do want you to understand is that this is extremely exceptional to every other history of denominational history that there is. Because you see this, you have splits, you also have what? Mergers, reunions. You've got them in all kinds of places here. Whenever you see boxes closing, arrows going down, those are reunifications. The struggle to reunify is distinct to Presbyterianism. I don't have it uh, available, but if you were to say, and I'm not picking on these people because I'm not, I'm not one of them, but if you were to see a Baptist family tree in the United States, you know what you'd see? You'd see the start of splits, and it would just get worse and worse and worse, and nobody ever reunites. And the Congregationalists are the same way. The Assembly of God's the same way. Everybody else is the same way. Once they're split, we're gone. We don't, want, we don't even want to talk to you. The Presbyterians are the only ones who are ever burdened to reunite. And that is to the, our credit. And I, I always need to toot that horn. Okay, so that's the, that's the split we're talking about right here. The 1741 split. And... During that division, during that time when you've got the old side, new side split, four new siders decide they want to plant a new, church, a new college in the central area of New Jersey, that area where no, there's, no, there's no school available. We're, we, we want to start a new school. And four new siders, you know what that means now, 
one of our, 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 the, push, the motivating driving force to starting this new school, and they get it going. There's, after, after several trip ups and, and roadblocks and, and hassles, they finally get it going in 1746. Um, some, of the, some of the names of this college are quite prestigious. You have Jonathan Dixon to start with in 1747, Aaron Burr Sr., his son's the one who's going to shoot Hamilton, takes it for a number of years. Jonathan Edwards becomes president of this school in 1758. He is actually very progressive in some things to get the school going. He volunteers to take a new, I think it's smallpox vaccine, to show everybody that it's safe. He promptly dies from it. Uh, but he was, he was president for a, pre, a little period of time. Jacob Green, Samuel Davies, maybe you've heard of him a little bit. He's, he's the evangelist down in the Virginia area. He comes up, he's president for a while. Samuel Finley, John Blair, and then it's time for their ex invitation to uh, Jonathan, uh, uh, John Witherspoon. Now, now that I've told you about the background of, of the College of New Jersey, can you think of a reason why, Jonathan, why John Witherspoon would turn down the invitation? He's old school. He's old side. He is solid Calvinist. Now, he is very much in, this, in, the, in, the, in the idea of personalizing the gospel. He wants people to be, quote, saved. But he is very much on the side. He is immovable on the side of you, your man, your minister needs a solid education. He needs to be a theologian in every sense of the word, and he needs to be Calvinistic. So when that first invitation comes, it uh, well, the first the first thing that happens is is uh, uh, you know the, the school gets started, goes through these 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 other presidents are there. In the meantime, and quite importantly, but not necessarily well known, is that in 1757, the old and the new sides come together. The reason for that is the First Awakening has died out. The zeal for the new side has now kind of coasted to a stop. And so the differences between the two sides are not all that critical. And they realize, well, we can work together after all, and they come together. So the Presbyterians reunite. And then the first invitation to Witherspoon comes out, but of course he doesn't, he doesn't quite understand this unification. He still thinks there's the old side, new side problem. And so Witherspoon de declines that invitation. His own feelings were conservative. He had no sympathy for those who preferred emotional piety to educated, reasonable orthodoxy. But by this time, there really was uni unanim unim unanimity in Presbyterians once again. The fire of the Great Awakening had died down. It no longer was causing an irritant within the, within the Presbyterian church. And so when Witherspoon realized this and he was extended an invitation again, he accepted. So now Witherspoon has come to the colonies. Witherspoon arrives at the college in 1768, and he would serve in that capacity until 1794. So he is there from before this, the war between the, the Revolutionary War and after it. He is there for the entire duration of that struggle in the, in the colonies. 26 years he was, he was president of the school. His first immediate challenge was financial. The school was poor. School needed bucks. And although the split was formally reconciled in the church, reaching out to both sides financially was still a challenge. People still had bitter feelings in this regard. And he traveled far and wide seeking both money and students for the school. That's not just the beginning. That's all the way through his 26 years of presidency. He would wear himself out keeping this school alive and making it grow. He was a member of several administrative committees. You remember, he was a man who got involved. 
He, got, he, he joined this. He was a member of that. He was in this. He was involved in every aspect that had anything to do with prospering the school. And he, there was good financial progress was being made right up until the war. For several years during the war, however, the trustees couldn't meet, and so the, the business could not be transacted. And during that time, Witherspoon was using his own salary to keep the school going. And he even housed some of the poorer students in the, in the, president's, uh, in the president's house, which was uh, adjacent to the, to, the, to the building they were using to teach. He also brought 300 volumes from his library over and gave it to the school so that they would have books to study. He fostered a scientific spirit in this. He wasn't just teaching religion. He wanted, every, he wanted this school to be the, uh, uh, the, embrace all of the arts and sciences. And so he fostered a, a strong scientific spirit in the college. He did a majority of the teaching himself. He taught Hebrew and Greek and Latin and divinity and moral philosophy and eloquence. Presentation, in other words. Rhetoric on demand, if you will. It's, uh, it's, I didn't put it, I didn't frame it this way, but, uh, but I've always been fascinated with his lectures on moral philosophy. And for that reason, as I knew this was coming, that's, that's the reason that I held my my Christian ed class on the Ten Commandments. That would, that's moral philosophy as far as he would be concerned. And so it was kind of, pat, kind of patterning uh, that, that uh, same motif. James Madison, one of our later presidents, was gradu graduated in 1771, testified to Witherspoon's character as at once strong and gentle. Besides doing his work in the college, he preached every Sunday in the chapel that's the church in the, in the town next, adjacent to the school. He preached good, good, healthy, long sermons, you Presbyterians. One in the morning, one in the evening, or one in the afternoon, rather. And he was known to be heard by John Adams. I, I, I um, watched a, a... I've read John Adams by David McCullough, and I've seen the, the, the portrayal of John Adams... Uh, on what Netflix, I think. Um, David McCullough, of course, was, was not a Christian in any sense of the term. And so you read his book and you watch his, his, um, that video and you see nothing of Witherspoon. And yet it's very clear in the history that Witherspoon had a strong effect on John Adams. And just, just a, a side note for you. He uh, listened to, one, on one occasion he said, uh, John Adams heard Dr. Witherspoon all day, 1774. Uh, 1774 is right in the middle of it. The first eight years of the school uh, saw rapid growth. The faculty began to grow, uh, but with the coming of the, of the war, the enrollment decreased. Why? Well, you might think, well, because people can't risk traveling when, when they might get attacked. Money was short, money was tight, those things are true. But you know what most of the students did? signed up for the war because they had been inspired by what they heard in class. They signed up for the war. They went off to, to fight, for the, fight for the colonies. Many students caught the military spirit, some of them enlisting. Uh, in 1773, Paul Revere, making his famous ride, you know, blum, 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 road pass, uh, mode post-haste through the town, bearing to Burlington and Philadelphia the news of the Boston Tea Party, went right through the school. They saw it, you know, Paul Revere stopped and got a glass of water, said thank you. In the fall of 1776, well now we know what that is, right? Fall of 1776, the British invaded the province and Witherspoon was forced to flee for his life. They were marching through the area and they said, let's stop at Princeton and say hi. Witherspoon ran for his life, which he was, should have done. They focused their cannons on the main building of the campus, trying to blow it to pieces, managed to do a significant amount of damage, and, uh, and made it completely unfit for use, theoretically. For a year and a half, Witherspoon taught classes in the building anyway, almost to stick it to the English. Uh, and even though he was now unpaid, now the school had no money and he was running on empty, 
He did this completely pro bono, as they say. The endowment of the, of the college suffered the loss of funds because later after the war because of the depreciation of money. Right now, young people, we are having an inflation, which means what? Does anybody know what inflation means? More money, less goods. And they're having a depreciation of money, which means what? You can't get anything for any amount of money. And so this, that, way, that is what might be coming here as we are, live in our day. But the depreciation of the paper currency suffered because of the ending of the war. There was a financial crisis. It, the economy of the, of the colonies collapsed for a, a brief period of time. By 1777, he told the trustees it was impossible to carry on the college at this rate. This just can't be sustained. But after the war, Witherspoon returned to his aggressive efforts to raise money. He had a lot of friends back home. And, uh, and he thought, well, I've tapped them once. I'm going to try again. Uh, Efforts, uh, you know, proved very successful, but it was not enough. Uh, and Witherspoon ha almost single-handedly supported and drove the school on. Uh, one, one historian says, many a poor boy owed his education to Witherspoon's generosity. One interesting uh, thing that comes along uh, in his uh, tenure at the school is in 1783, is the war over by this time? Is it? When does it end? 1783. The year the war ended. Did you know it went on that long? How many of you know much at all about the Revolutionary War, how it was fought? No, oh, we got some, got some kids over there, okay. That's what I kind of thought. We, you know, we've, we, we study, we hear, we watch videos about World War II a lot. That's on television a lot, World War II. You know. World War I, not so much. You kind of have to go looking for World War I. Civil War is another fascinating study among historians. When it comes to the Re Revolutionary War, it really is kind of a, a vague, isn't it? We really don't, I mean, okay, some things come up, but how it, Fort you know, uh, uh, Bunker Hill, um, uh, you know, the shot heard around the world. Okay, we got that. Where did it end? Does anybody know where it ended? What? What? It ended at Yorktown. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Or it started in Yorktown? Do you know for sure? All right, let me give you a, let me give you a little bit of, a war, of, of, of uh, notice about what we're going to do next week. I'm going to have, a, I'm going to, I'm going to have my, my, my presentation, and then I want to follow that with a 20-minute video that will quickly go through the entire uh, Revolutionary War, and you'll be able to see exactly how it, go, how it went. And I think that'll be a very helpful insight. So please plan on staying just a few minutes longer next week for that. Okay. One interesting thing is, in 1783, the ending of the, of the war... The college hosted a meeting of the Continental Congress. Why would the Cong uh, Continental Congress come to Princeton? It was because some of the soldiers that had fought in the war hadn't been paid for a long time, and they were protesting. We want our back pay. The Continental Congress, which in those days was meeting in where? What? F Philadelphia decided that they would take a little vacation. And so they went up and they met at the College of New Jersey because they knew that that would be friendly territory. And while the Continental Congress was meeting in the, in, uh, in the College of New Jersey, uh, one, of the, one of the ones that was there, of course, was General George Washington. He had decided he was going to attend this year's college commencement to salute Witherspoon for the influence that he had been to their side. And he was attended by an English officer 
who was there under understanding that he's helping to mop up things after they have surrendered. So it's this English officer that is observing this commencement at the College of New Jersey next to George Washington. And after he goes back to his room, this is what he writes. He says, an account of the present face of things in America would be very defective indeed if no mention was made of this political firebrand who perhaps had no, not a less share in the revolution than Washington himself. He poisons the minds of his students and through them the continent. Who in the world is he talking about? John Witherspoon. Now next week we're going to see what he's talking about. But we needed to get, him, get, the, get the background of him as a president in here first. By 1774 it became imperatively necessary something had to be done, financially in other words. And so he did what he did at the very beginning. He goes back to his friends in Europe and he tries to squeeze the palms and, and uh, you know, and grease the skids. But, you've, but now the war is over and the Europeans are a bit beat up and bruised by how things went. And so Witherspoon gets, his, gets the door slammed in his face a lot for his efforts. That, and the fact that that happens stuns Witherspoon. Uh, and so he does something he hasn't done before. He comes back, he turns to the general assembly of the church, and he says, guys, you want a seminary here? I mean, you want a, a college here? You got to help me pay for it. And so he appealed to the Presbyterians, and they came in strong and helped him with that. Uh, and for many more years afterwards, uh, the... Uh, the, the, church, the, the school was in, was in very decent shape. Slowly the country began to recover from the disastrous effects of the war, um, the rebuilding, the removal of damage, the burying of bodies, all of that was involved. Um, think of Ukraine now, for example. But the number of students increased rapidly. Presbyterianism, again, was on the rise, and that was a good sign. As Witherspoon grew older, however, he was beginning to leave more and more of his responsibilities to his vice president. Now he actually had one, didn't have one for many years, but now he's got one, and he's starting to leave more and more because when he went on that frustrating trip to Europe, it damaged, it got, it, it, it damaged his health, and he started to see himself going downhill, starting to slide. And although he was never formally called, that's always a curiosity, you know, when he first got to the school, he went into town every Lord's Day, he preached twice at the local Presbyterian church. He did that all 26 years he was there. He was never called to be their minister. He was always a guest. And uh, although he was never formally called, he, he continued preaching there. He presided over his last commencement at the school in 1794, and two months later he died. Witherspoon transformed a college designed predominantly to train clergymen into a school that would equip the leaders of a new country. He was not interested in it being just a proto-seminary. He wanted to train leaders for the entire nation. He saw this as a unique opportunity for him to transform this school and make it a preparatory school for all kinds of occupations and all kinds of, uh, of services. <coughs> Students who later played predominant roles in the, nation's, uh, in the new nation's development included James Madison, Aaron Burr, Philip Fernow, Willop Bradford, Hugh Henry Breck, uh, Breckenridge, and from among his students, 37 judges, three of whom became justices in the U.S. Supreme Court, 10 cabinet officers, 12 members of the Continental Congress, 28 United States senators, and 49 United States congressmen sat under his teaching as students. Do you think he had an effect on things? Do you think his drive produced fruit and not just 
stuck in the mud Calvinism. Here was a man who was alive for what he wanted and had a vision for his church and his nation to be. Now we've seen the, we've seen the, the school side. Next week, Lord willing, we will see his, his involvement in the political side. Okay, let's pray. Oh, wait, wait, let me, any questions? Any questions? Yeah, Nancy. Can you make available your references that you put as W or D? Yeah, um, I can. Uh, they're all online. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll send, I'll send the, the resource I'm using primarily for you. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. How much, I'm sorry, what? Uh, how much does Princeton recognize... Donald how much does Princeton recognize the contribution? Um, they are very proud of him as one of their former presidents. But his really only claim to fame is that he was the only minister to sign the, the, the Declaration of Independence. Um, I'll give you a preview about this. You, you probably figured it out already. Now, I'll give you a preview about this. Witherspoon did not believe in separation of faith and state. Church and state, of course, is a misnomer. That was the idea that the Roman Catholics were in charge of government. But what that really means, especially today, is Christians have no place in government. And he was adamantly against that. He would push that and, and push that and say, our place is in the chairs. And to be involved with it as much as possible. But Princeton today only tips their hat in that regard. He's one of ours. He's, he's, he was one of our presidents. Here. Yes, anybody else? Yeah, Bob. What made him become so pro-American? It had to do with, the reason I spent so much time with his Scottish background is that he, 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 uh, he got a, a real sense of, of, uh, of wanting equality among the classes. He didn't like the, um, those, uh, the rich who were in charge and pushing their weight around, and he wanted to support the, uh, the lower classes. And he spent a great deal of time in Scotland doing that. So those, that's where he cut his teeth on political freedom. And so when he came over here, uh, it, it, it's, it, was, it, it, was, it was written, it was like a, blur, a breath of fresh air that, uh, that he saw liberty in the, in the, in the battle. And uh, he was all for it from the, first, from the first moment he got off the boat. Yeah, Joshua, Joseph, I think Joshua. I probably um, know your answer on this, but... <laughs> Yeah. Which side would you agree more with? So I think we both have good ideas. I like Witherspoon. He he turned out to actually be kind of riding the fence. You can't have the dry, dusty, uh, you know, librarian theology and not have any burden for people's souls. But like Witherspoon, to just set somebody out there with no education whatsoever, that is, that is the way that lots of heresies get started because they start to come up with their own ideas that are cock, you know, crazy, and before you know it, you've got people being led astray. Ministers should know what they're talking about. I only pretend to. <laughs> Ministers should know what they're talking about if they're going to teach you something that they want you to believe. But that should include your need for Christ. So it's right on the fence. Yes, Joyce. I just think it's uh, commendable that Bob and you know, um, Jason are going to do this in Africa so that the pastors there have that Bible right. background rather than, like you said, they just they got saved and they go out and they start churches. Exactly, you know? exactly. You know, they're... they're they're saying that education for the ministers is very important. And not just to set them out. See, the Methodists and the Baptists, again, not to kick on them, but the Methodists and the Baptists, they wanted, after the war was their period of time when they exploded. And the reason they, you know, as, as the misnomer goes, as the, as the famous old statement goes, 
in the, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, the Methodists and the Baptists would say, oh, you want to be a minister? Great. There's the horse. Take off. The Presbyterians would say, oh, you want to be a minister? Great. Go to school. You know, and, and that was seen, uh, that was, that was a, 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 you know, a, a, a caricature of the difference. The Baptists were sending men out left and right. The Methodists were sending out men left and right in, the, in that period of time. And sure enough, they, rose, they, 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 over, they, they grew much more in popularity, and by the Civil War, they, over num they outnumbered the Presbyterians quite dramatically. Yeah? Just a very quick question. Yes. Not in those days, no. They were, they were Arminian, yes. In those days, clearly they were Arminian. Okay? All right, now let's pray. Father, I thank you very much for the patience of these folks. Bless us as we continue to study this. Help us to really understand what it means for you to um, raise up your people and to put them to work. Thank you that we can... Uh, regard our education as valuable and important and how, how blessed we are to be able to get it in these days. Help us to then rise and use it in the world that you put us into so that, Lord, we make the changes in, uh, in, in, in the directions that you would have us go. We thank you for the vision that these men had, and we pray, Lord, that we might have that same kind of strength. In Jesus' name, amen.